Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to our studios here in a snowy Rochester, Indiana today. And well, it used to be, uh, you know, we would always say we, we have the sectional snow. You know, it always seemed like it snowed around sectional time. Well, it seems like here the last uh, few years we've been getting some regional action as well. So the, the snow's been coming a little bit later and we got regionals. I remember the, the, there was state snow about four years ago. Yeah, and yeah. It, uh, Indy, Indy got about six inches on the day of the boys' state finals. Yeah. So it, that was when Southwood was in it, I remember. Yeah, we could still be uh, still be set for some of that. But mm -hmm. uh, we're here uh, in studios talking sports with Val. Val, of course, joins me. His uh, Hoosiers just pulled off a big win over number one seed Illinois in the welcome Big to the Ten tournament. Welcome to the post-game show. <laughs> Val's post game here. show. Here we we can talk about. We're, we're, we're doing the post game show at two o'clock on a Friday, but here we are. Yeah, we're uh, we're taking calls. Right, our next <laughs> caller wins a uh, ten pack of uh, tickets to the uh, championship game. No, no phones ringing, so no, I guess no. we're safe. So, no. um, but anyway, uh, a lot of stuff going on here. We're going to wrap up our uh, winter season as all of our teams are gone. Unfortunately, nobody made it out of sectional this year, and. When we sat here last week, we still had five teams going, and uh, that was down to two by Saturday, and uh, both of those teams were eliminated Saturday. No, no, no regional or no sectional champions coming out of our area this this year, and we've been kind of spoiled, you know, over the last few years, obviously with Rochester and Caston, and even Argus having quite a bit of success in their sectionals, but uh, not this year. Yeah, I mean, we had a lot of good players in our area. We, you know, I've been, uh, you know, thinking about the RTC players of the year and our first team and our second team and our honorable mention, and it's not going to be an easy selection because we had a lot of good players in our area yeah. on the boys' side. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to have uh, we're going to have our show today, and then Val's going to be off next week, and then I'll be off the following week, so we won't be back until April first uh, for our next show. So. We're actually going to let uh, let all that kind of simmer a little bit and, and let uh, let the dust settle on the winter season. And then on April 1st, when we come back, we're going to do our RTC, uh, all RTC teams for girls basketball, boys basketball, wrestling, and swimming uh, on that April 1st episode. And then, of course, we'll be uh, getting into some spring sports by then as well. So that's kind of the plan. We're going to uh, kind of wrap things up with the winter sports um, First off, let's go over some scores here from Friday. At Wawa C, Northwood defeated Tippecanoe Valley 38-33. That was a game Valley led at the half. Valley led by six at the half. They led 21-15, and then Northwood goes right on a 7-0 run to take a 22-21 lead. <coughs> Valley did a great job defensively in that game. They held Brenner, Cade Brenner, Northwood's leading scorer to just 11. And he didn't shoot the, and it was kind of an inefficient 11 as well. But Ian Rush, their 6'5 guard, who's also a really good defender, he also had 11. It just came hard for Valley to get buckets in the second half, only uh, 12 points in the second half, and you just have to find ways to get buckets even against really good teams like Northwood. And the number three Panthers were able to advance, and you saw what, Nor and then if you look what happened on Saturday night, Northwood beat Wawa C 40 to 23. Mm -hmm. So they are the real deal defensively. They are long and athletic, yeah. and they are tough to score on them. Yeah, usually if you hold a team to 38 points like Valley did to Northwood, you think that's, you know, you got a pretty good shot, but right. Northwood's defense is so good. That... Right, I mean, Northwood's, they're long, they're athletic, and they complement their long and athletic guys with good shooters. Mm -hmm. And so to hold them to 38, I'm, I'm, it's a heartbreaker of a loss for Valley. But, you know, 14 and 10 on the year, um, you know, I, this program's really making strides, and I, you know, I guess we'll talk about it next year too, but I think things are set up very well as we head into the, you know, and, and just how they dealt with the tragedy all year as well. I mean, but how, you know, as we get ready for, you know, the 2022-23 season, I think Valley is going to be one of the favorites in the TRC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so moving over to the Triton sectional on Friday night, Argus uh, defeated Lacrosse 64-28 in the first game, and then Triton uh, defeated Culver 39-25. to And, you know that was a that was a really feisty Culver team. I mean, they gave Triton uh, quite a uh, quite a fest, you know, game there. Culver is physical, and they do not back down against anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know I we I had seen that in their Wednesday game when they beat uh, Oregon Davis, and I think it continued for the most part. I mean, they were you know, but they again for Culver the problem the whole year was just getting buckets mm -hmm. when they when they needed it, and they didn't really have kind of a go-to guy. 
uh, you know, Mason Herbert might have been the closest thing to that, but he was more of a three-point shooter. But um, and, and they don't, and since they don't get the ball in the paint that much, they don't shoot a lot of free throws. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to get points that way too. And yeah, but I mean, take out, I mean, the second half. I mean, Culver was right there with Triton, mm-hmm. and that again, the defense, the the culture stays the same in terms of they embrace defense and they embrace the work, the work that goes into defense. Kyle Evans has said. We like practicing defense more than offense because that's the first team I've ever been a part of that that really embraces that in practice. But, mm-hmm. again, as they move forward, it's finding ways to consistently get buckets. Yeah, much like North or much like Tippecanoe Valley against Northwood, Triton only scored 39 points, so good defensive effort there by Culver. Mm-hmm. Just like you said, they just couldn't get the ball in the basket on the other side. Right, and they held Ashton Oviedo to four points. Mm. Um, you know, that's a great job. That's a senior guard who they look to a lot for scoring. So, right. you know, you know, they've got, again, there's some pieces coming back that will be kind of the nucleus of that program going forward. But yeah, Culver played, I mean, <laughs> there's no lack of effort and there's no lack of physicality or, or determination on their part. That's for, that, that was for sure, you know, watching the highlights of that game. And uh, Argus over lacrosse, sixty four twenty eight. Uh, that was a pretty good lacrosse team, and Argus kind of dismantled them. And that was a lacrosse team coming off a really nice win over Couts. Couts, mm-hmm. of course, made the state finals last year. It's not Couts sure. graduate, but still, I think that was somebody said it was the first time lacrosse had beaten Couts in like decades, like mm-hmm. twenty years. Um, lacrosse had. We talked about Ben Garwood of lacrosse. He had sixteen of their twenty eight, but they shut everybody else down. And Argus just had too many weapons for them on the other end. Yeah. 64 points, that's a, that's a nice output for, uh, for Argus. Right, I mean, and, and Col- you know, Argus is a team that, you know, we said Culver has trouble getting buckets. Argus has a variety of options. They can get the ball inside when you talk about Dylan Kindig. They can get the ball in off the dribble when you talk about J.J. Morris or Michael Richard. And then they can shoot the three as well. I mean, Teddy Redinger can hit the three. J.J. can hit the three. Michael Richard can hit the three. Yeah. And, J- and Jake Stoltz had 18 in that game as well. I mean, Jake was playing the best basketball of his career at the end of his senior season. Yeah. So that would set up the uh, rematch, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but the Argus Dragons and Triton Trojans for uh, number four. The game we've been waiting for all year right. since last year's sectional final. Right. Uh, we'll talk about that one in a minute, but uh, first the uh, the other uh, sectional over at Tri-County. We'll talk about game two first. Pioneer gets the win, 55-35 over South Newton. Um, Pioneer, you know, they had a nice draw. I mean, nobody's going to lie, right? They're not going to mm-hmm. they're not going to try and say that they, you know, worked their way through a uh, very difficult draw. They actually had a really good draw to get into the sectional championship. But you still got to go out and you got to win those games. And the, the Panthers were able to get it done uh, over the South Newton Rebels. Right. I was there for that game. Um, Pioneer made some subtle defensive adjustments as the game went on with their zone. Played a, played a little 3-2, then went back to a 2-3. Coach Darren McKegg just wanted the team to play just with a little more. Uh, their feet weren't moving a lot in the early going. They, they kind of kept their feet going in the, in the second quarter, especially the third quarter. I think South Newton had something like a nine-minute field goal drought, and that was that was just, that was in the, mostly in the, the second half. And... Um, Meanwhile, offensively, Pioneer looked really confident and comfortable in ways that they, I mean, they, we knew they'd be good defensively. They made a lot of progress offensively as the season progressed, and that South Newton game was really evidence of it. I mean, when you talk about the three-point shooters and Drew McKegg and Gavin Clem, Gavin Clem hit two big threes in the, uh, sec- in the third quarter mm-hmm. to kind of give them some, some breathing room in that game. You know, Drew McKay came off the bench to score 13, and Caleb Sweet came off the bench to score 11. Definitely, they, you know, Coach McKay, you know, he's got five seniors. He just put started his five seniors and brought McKay and Sweet off the bench. And that gave them, you know, some nice depth, mm-hmm. really. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, Pioneer, they were definitely developing their weapons. And Pioneer also had only four turnovers in that game against South. And you have only four turnovers in the sectional game. That's a sign that you're really peaking toward the end of the season. You're taking care of the ball. You're playing at a good pace, mm-hmm. but you're not playing. But you're playing under control at the same time. Yeah. And Brock Robinson, the point guard. You know, again, he's not a guy who's going to score a lot of points. I think he only had three points in the game. He had a three pointer in the first half, but just really ran ran the offense well. Got them into their offense. Yeah. Yeah. So a big win for Pioneer, uh, putting them into the sectional championship. 
the first game of the night, that was kind of the game that we've, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the quasi-sectional uh, championship, even though it was in the semifinal round with North White and Caston. And we'll take a little bit deeper look at this one here because that was a, uh, you know... It's worth the time because it was maybe the game of the year. Yeah. I mean, this was a game where just it was just back and forth and just guys making great plays and great shots on both ends. Well, let's this run, was high-level stuff. Let's run through this here, Val. I'll let you kind of give the mm-hmm. cliff notes on this game, uh, North White and the Caston Comets. Right, and again, what you notice right off the bat is all 10 starters in this game are seniors. Jeffrey Stevens of North, North White, he is their big guy, and he was terrific. He had 14 points in the first half. Right. And a lot of them, I mean, again, he, he doesn't shoot much beyond about five feet, but He's a big guy. He's hard to get around, and if he boxes you out, he's going to get that rebound, and he's going to get, and he gets a couple buckets every game, seemingly on offensive rebounds. Cass was able to drive the ball to the basket a lot in the first half, and Coach Sipkema had to make some uh, adjustments. But again, they look down. Nice pass by Nate Miller to Stevens for a bucket. He was just he's just hard to stop. I mean, he's a big, big dude. He's six four. I think he weighs up. Okay, he's, I'm guessing at least 230, 240, maybe 250. Yeah. And that complements their guards. There's Kane Shanelob with the bucket. And Kane really gave Caston a boost in the first half in this game. Yeah, Kane, Kane is just a sophomore, right? He's He's got a couple years he to go. He is a junior. A junior, okay. Yeah. And there's a turnover as North White gets kind of cut off in the baseline here. And this is a nice move by Kane. Finishing in transition again. It's a six-four guy who's running the court like that. Yeah, not a lot of teams have a guy like that, especially at the one-a level. And then nice footwork by Joey Spin, and he hits at the buzzer. And Caston left sixteen to twelve at the end of one quarter. I love uh, I love Blair. Uh, they've they've dubbed his uh, spin move the spin cycle. Yeah. And there's Joey again. As Nor- North White really had issues stopping Joey off the dribble, and he got to the bucket seemingly whenever he wanted. And then there's Stevens again. Yeah, he was a big president inside there for yeah. North White all night. But Sam Smith kept going at Stevens on the other end. And Stevens kept going at Caston in the post. And again, Joey just driving to the basket. And this is another awesome move, a spin mm-hmm. move by Shane Lobb. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, Caston led by six. And then... Joey pumped up after a three-point play. And then this three-pointer by Jake Passion is good, and Caston led by nine. Yeah. 31-22. And then a Stevens had a bucket right at the buzzer. And that was big for North White as they got back within seven. And then this guy got involved in the second half, Hunter Pogue. I think that was his only, that might have been his only two-point basket of the game. Bryce Rudisill scored in, uh, in the post. Bryce had 10 on the night. And see, they start helping out better. So Joey's got to pull up and shoot from the outside, but he hits. And then that man gets involved, Bentley Bushman. Bryce Rudisill just working so hard underneath the rim. He misses the free throw. Smith misses, but I think the ball is last touched here by North White. It's cast and ball. Actually, I know there's a foul. I, yeah. So, but yeah, North White, the, the two adjustments that Coach Sipkema said he made was they were starting off their offense too low and their guards, Pogue and Bushman, weren't getting involved the way he wanted. And the defensive adjustment they made was they had to stop Joey Spin off the dribble. He was just, he was just carte blanche to the rim. And, you know, that's Sam, you know, he gets inside on you and he, They'll give you that little brush off, and that kind of gives them a little space against a taller defender like Stevens. Remember, Stevens is 6'4", and Sam's 6'1". Mm-hmm. And then this guy gets red hot. Hunter Pogue. There's a great uh, social media thing with him and Drake Fleck, the old North White player, when he was Hunter was a little boy, hanging out with Drake Fleck. Oh, and yeah, yeah. Drake h- hanging out with him after Saturday night. Again, that was a sweet move by Kane Shanlop. Yeah. 
with the, to tie the game in the fourth quarter, that was something. That that was just a big play. Bushman grabbing an air ball out of midair and getting a three point play. And then look at that move by Bryce Rudisill. I mean, the spin move from the mid post. I had never seen Bryce do that before. Then Miller with the big bucket. I mean, again, teams teams are just making big play after big play. So it's now three minutes to go, and Caston, who was up by seven and a half, is now down by four. Yeah, and again, like it's going to be the, it's going to be Sam. Seemed like a lot of the momentum mm -hmm. was on the side of the Vikings there, and, and yeah. Sam able to uh, counter that a little bit and get him back within two. Mm -hmm. And this move by Rudisil, I thought he was going to spin back toward the middle. Instead, he spun back toward the baseline, used the rim to keep off the shot blocker away from him. Yeah. And then hits the free throw and cast and let 54-53 with two minutes to go. Nice little five zero run there for the Comets. Yeah. Puts him back up. Again, North White loved the high ball screen with Stevens in the second half. But they're here, Bushman gets cut off, and he steps out of bounds, and now Caston has the ball in a one-point lead. Yeah, North White, they really went to that high ball screen offense a lot. I mean, Stevens is, again, when he sets a screen, you get screened. Yeah, yeah. You stay screened, and, and then Pogue and Bushman would just kind of read that and make their move off that. I don't think I did much cutting here at the mm -hmm. end. It's kind of going to be the last two minutes of this game because it was such a, a great finish to the game. Uh, I wanted to, to make sure that uh, we got a chance to kind of go through it. Yeah, this one was a big miss. Uh, front end of a one and one by Zyder. And then, you know, Bushman to Pogue. And Pogue, I think he's something like a 48% three-point shooter. Oh, my gosh. That was not an easy shot. And he, no. nothing but net. Off balance with a hand yeah. in his face. Yeah. Pogue had 19. And then this shot by Joey was just incredible. Left handed off a spin. Yeah. That off was a that spin, was spin, the spin cycle, cycle to tie that's the game. Square spin cycle, yeah. I mean, my jaw dropped when he made that shot. But then back at the other end, and they lose Bushman for a second. He scores. He's fouled. The foul's on Sam Smith, and that's five on Sam. He falls mm -hmm. out of the game with 55.5 seconds to go. That was that was mm -hmm. big right there because yeah. you know Sam had been playing so well. Mm -hmm. You know Bushman he had two in the first half and he had eighteen in the second half. He had twenty for the game. Mm -hmm. He was great and you know Pioneer did a good job of. We'll talk about this on the Saturday night game, but Pioneer did a good job of stopping Bushman, held him to four on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. But. And then he's going to hit the free throw, and North White leads 59-56 at this point. And then Castle only had five turnovers for the game, but that was one of them. Bushman with the steal, and that was big too. I think North White's in the double bonus at this point. Yeah. I made it a two-possession game. But he is going to miss the second. And watch Cast, and they're gonna they're gonna get Cade Zider open as they run. There was a controversy here. The one official said over and back. The other said it was deflected. Jake Passion certainly thought it was deflected. He kind of, mm -hmm. and they just said inadvertent whistle. No turnover. So Castle will inbound again with about th with 30.6 seconds to go, and they're down by four. And watch Cade. It's just enough space out Pogue, and he hits a three. Kate had not scored all game until that three-pointer. Really? Those were his first three points of the game. That made it 
60 to 59. And you know North White wants the ball in the hands of their senior point guard, Hunter Pogue. We should mention Drake Fleck was the point guard on North White's 2014 sectional championship team. Okay. They had the two Fleck brothers. That was a team that beat Culver in the regional semifinal at Triton in that heartbreaking game. Beat him by one, Eli. Uh, yeah. The Manchester coach was the Eli. Uh, trying a blank on his name. So when anyway, Poe gets those two free throws. And then this is going to be just a tough off-balance shot with four seconds to go by Zyder, and it goes out of bounds. And North White would hit one of two free throws, and this would be the final 3.5 seconds of Eli Henson. That's what I'm thinking of. No good at the buzzer by Zyder, and North White wins 63-59. to 59. Yeah, so the uh, the Vikings would advance then to uh, play the Pioneer Panthers on Saturday night. And, you know, Pioneer at, at times, uh, you know, had a had a really good game going there, but, uh, you know, just too much North White in the end. Boy, the story of the game from Pioneer's standpoint was Jacob Ziegler. 16 points, a career high, and he does it in the sectional final in the final game of his career. He was awesome, mm-hmm. and he's not, you know he was kind of that that five man, kind of the center in that, or, or in kind of the, if they played four around one, he could play in kind of that that post area. And uh, you know, you, Jacob, you know, you think of more as like a kind of a distributor, kind of a guy who helps the other guys out scoring. But Jacob was terrific. I think he had nine in the first quarter of that game. I mean, he he, he kept them afloat for the longest time, but. Unfortunately, it was Nate Miller who was just tremendous. He had, I think, he, he, I think he had only eight against Caston on Friday, but he had twenty-eight against Pioneer. He was awesome. Twenty-eight. Yeah, twenty-eight. Wow. He averaged just fifteen or sixteen, and mm-hmm. he, averaged, he had twenty-eight. One of the games of his career, and he's, you know, he's the third guy. I mean, if you spend too much time focusing on Pogan Bushman, mm-hmm. he's the guy that can bite you, and he was the one who did on Saturday night. Yeah, because you said they held Bushman in check with with four. With four. And, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. So the final there, uh, North White wins 65-46 over the Panthers, and congratulations, you win a sectional, and, and now you got to go play against uh, Gary 21st Century, probably one of the best teams in, in 1A in the Triton Regional. It's going to be an interesting matchup because I would imagine Gary 21st Century, you know, they, they got challenged against Marquette Catholic in their uh, sectional final. Will they try and press North White full court? I would imagine they would at least try it at the start of the game. Mm-hmm. I don't think North White has been pressed much this season. Right. I can't imagine they that probably haven't been more because they it doesn't work right, against them. Right. So uh, I think Gary 21st Century, they'll, they'll need to be convinced not to press before mm-hmm. they stop. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll see how North White handles it. Yeah. Should be interesting, of course, you know, the Vikings with five senior starters. I mean, you know, who has more experience than that, right? Exactly. Who has more experience than that. But having said that, Gary, 21st century has by far played the tougher schedule. Right. I mean, they, they, they got a game with Ben Davis a couple of weeks ago. Oh, wow. Who won their 4A sectional. I mean, mm-hmm. so, and pl- I don't think a mid- playing a Midwest Conference schedule really prepares you to play a team like Gary, 21st century. So yeah. that'll be interesting. But, you know, one thing I, I remember talking with Coach McKegg Friday night before, after his team had beaten South Newton, but before the North White game, and he said, boy, North White is relentless. And and that that was that really made sense to me because, you know, you you could go on a you could go on a run against North White, but then, and feel you know go on a five zero six zero run and feel pretty good about yourself, but then they'll hit you with a seven zero or eight zero run and mm-hmm. and you and it's all it was like man weren't we playing well and it's like we're down again and that's kind of the way North White plays so that that should be at the very least it should be a very entertaining game yeah North yeah. White ring number five and Gary twenty first century ring number one yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And, uh, you know, the other sectional that we had on Saturday, uh, another team that, uh, you know, the winners would go into that Triton Regional, the uh, at Triton sectional number 50, 
the Triton Trojans and Argus Dragons. And like we said, version number four of, mm-hmm. uh, of this in a row, it was a 2-1 uh, advantage for Argus coming into this game, but Triton, the defending sectional champions, uh, coming into this year's uh, sectional championship game against the Dragons. And we'll take a little bit here more of a look from the Trojan Trench. And a lot of this is all about matchups. What was Triton going to do? They were going to play man. They they put Shively, who's 6'2", on the 6'6", J.J. Morris, and J.J. just shot over him at times. That was a little bit of a matchup nightmare for most teams. <laughs> Especially at the 1A level. Yeah. Especially at the 1A level. That was Ashton Oviedo making a nice move. As it turned out, that 5-2 to two lead Argus had at the very early stages of the game was their biggest lead of the game, 3. Mm-hmm. This is an Argus, again, coming into this game, Argus had, um, was averaging something around 64 points a game over the last four games. And that was uh, Tyson Yates hitting a long two-pointer. Argus led 8-7 to seven at the end of one quarter, and Jason Breeden said he was not happy with the t- way his team played in the first quarter. He goes, man, you're up by one? He goes, he goes, if we just keep, you know, just making, making the simple play and just, uh, Playing to our level, I mean, we'll be fine. Mm-hmm. And really, the, you know, it was just you know kind of a classic sectional battle in the second quarter. There's JJ again. Uh, just not many six kids, six six kids. Who can, I mean, not many kids at any size who can get that floater in the lane. Nice footwork here. JJ draws the foul, and Caden Graham, who was, you know, Graham is six five. He was kind of the one guy they had who could match up on JJ. I heard you say that too, and, and mm-hmm. I'm looking at, at Graham versus uh, Kindig right there, and I'm thinking I don't know if that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kindig looks quite a bit taller than Graham mm-hmm. to me, but because they got Dylan listed at six five, don't they? Yeah, it was a back and forth. That that was one of the big shots of the game, the three pointer by Yates, and that put Triton ahead for good at eighteen seventeen. And then Oviedo Yates, he gets. Argus off balance because they're worried about him shooting the three, and then he drives by him and goes in for a layup, and Triton led by three at the half, 20-17. to 17. Yeah, Yates, uh, last five points of the first half for Triton, and then uh, coming out in the, the second half, he right. just kept going. A 5-0 run in a game where a 5-0 run was big. Yeah. And then this play at the start of the second yeah. half, just a, an unforced error and an inbound pass leads to a layup by Yates. Yeah. Do, you know that, do you know that Tyson Yates and Taryn Yates are twins? Are they twins? Yeah. Yeah. I guess that makes sense since they're both seniors. Yeah, and uh, Tyson's brother, Tanner Shepard, an assistant coach at Triton. Oh. Tanner was on that 2013 Triton team that lost the state mm-hmm. championship game to Borden. Yeah. And J.J. was just terrific all night. He led the way with 16 Again, if you like man-to-man defense, this was the game for you. This nice little pass Huge right three, there. Yeah. Yeah. Huge three by Johnson. You know, Bruce Johnson hit four threes against Culver in, in the Friday night game. That was his only three Saturday night. And that play right there by Morris, that was just a, uh, you know, I want it more than anybody. Yeah. And uh, he puts that in mm-hmm. over his shoulder. Good enough I had to replay it. Mm-hmm. And again, the the help by Graham was there. It was just a little bit late. And he hits the free throw. And they run a back cut. And there's a bucket by Oviedo. I thought that was a really impressive shot, too, by Yates. Mm Mm-hmm. Kind of a tough fall away that put Triton up by six. That was their biggest lead at the time. Their Dylan Kindick follows up his own miss. That gets them back within a four. And Argus was down by four at the end of three quarters. Talking with Jason Breeden said, we, we prepared for Triton to play a 1-3-1 zone. Spent a lot of time in practice working on their one three one. They come out and man the whole game. They played basically man the whole yeah. game. I think Coach Coach Grove said they played 
Coach Gross said they played 1-3-1 for one possession, and Coach Breeden said they played 1-3-1 for one possession. And I think he said we got a wide open shot we missed, but it was so wide open that they went away from it. Mm -hmm. Kinding had a, just really fought hard in the post for a couple big buckets there. As Argus got back within 38-34. Morris. The free throw. That was, this is a big bucket by Cole McKinney, who's not really known as a scorer, but mm -hmm. scores off the dribble. This turned out to be Michael Richards' only field goal of the game. Argus made some, or Triton made some big free throws down the stretch here. You know, I like Coach Groves. I mean, I played against him in high school. He was at John Glenn when I was mm -hmm. in school, and obviously they always kind of had their way with, with us. But th this this play here, I mean, I don't know what happened, but it was it was bad for the Dragons right here. I don't know if they didn't realize that it was a one and one or yeah. what was going I, I, I think, on. I, they must have thought it was two shots. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Coach Breeden said we thought he was going to make it. We just assumed he was going to make it, but you can't. Mm -hmm. That that ended up costing them because uh, you know then they put in two free throws and what was a four point game is a six point game and right cuz Triton looked out like another 7 or 8 seconds off the clock which is 7 or 8 seconds is a lot of time at this point in the game right and Graham makes it a three possession game interesting enough these were these two free throws were the only two points of the game Graham scored and he's really he had really impressed me as kind of a kind of a microwave sixth man type who who can score off the bench Argus held him down mm -hmm. didn't he didn't have a field goal all game but those two free throws were big and all of a sudden it's a three possession game Talking with Coach Breeden afterwards, he talked a lot about, you know, when they're when you're a head coach, there's more. He goes, when you're an assistant coach, you can just watch, and well, if we lose the heartbreaker, it's, you know, you can just go home at the end of the night. But when you're a head coach, you, you just go through every possibility and every move that you could have made, and mm -hmm. it's definitely a tough lesson. Here's a three pointer coming up. I think this is going to be. Uh, Stoltz who hits it. Yeah, this was a tough shot, which he banked in. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine if they had the, the two points back off of the free throws with that missed block out and then the, the 10 seconds. I mean, you'd be looking at 15, 16 seconds here mm -hmm. in a, you know, a three-point game, and instead it's a five-point game with only 5.9 to go, and mm -hmm. you're, you're pretty much done at this point, unfortunately. Morris fouls Oviedo. You think about, yeah, I mean, the Going with the man-to-man, -man, I mean, you really have to have a trust in your players to do that. Mm-hmm. And the season ends for Argus as Triton wins by six, forty-five, thirty-nine. It's a good so, crowd, I thought, at Saturday night, too. I mean, they, they were really yeah. in with it. The Trojan Trench is a great place for a basketball game when oh, it's yeah. a full crowd. It yeah. really can, kind of contains the noise well. It kind of pushes it down to the floor, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they'll have uh, they'll have some more games coming up there on Saturday. Of course, the Triton Trojans are uh, going to be playing at home for a uh, regional. They're going to be taking on Fremont in their first game, and then, like we said, it's going to be Gary and 
North White in the other game, so it yeah, should be a good one. The Triton Fremont game should be a good one too. I mean, I think both. I think Fremont will try to push the pace a little bit too. Yeah, and they've got some shooters. I think they'll spread the floor well. It'll be a good game. That was a Fremont team that gave Couts everything they can handle in last year's regional. So they, you know, they're they're back. I mean, they've got experienced kids who've played in big games before. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be tough. Obviously, you got the number one team in the state coming in there with Gary Twenty First Century, but. You know they they've got to they've got to win too just like anybody else to mm -hmm. to advance past the the regional round. And mm -hmm. So, you know, regional Saturday is, is set up intentionally hard, right? You know, you got to win two games against regional cha or sectional champions. Right. You got to play your best game of the season, and then you got to play an even better game. Yeah. The, later on that day. Yeah. And two games in one, and mm -hmm. but if you win, you're in the final four. Right. So. And, and you also see, and I, I guess we say this, you know, before the girls regional as well. You see who's happy just to win a sectional, right. and who has ambitions for even more. Right. So that uh, should be a fun day there at Triton. Unfortunately, uh, all of our teams have uh, have ended their seasons, and they're going to be looking forward to uh, you know spring sports. And then, you know, as we move into the next season, I guess we could talk a little bit. Um, you got you got to think, um, you know. Obviously, Rochester, of, of all of our teams, you talk about Valley. Valley and Rochester, probably, of all of our teams, look to be really, really tough coming into next year. I mean, Rochester was kind of in that little bit of a transition phase this year. And mm -hmm. uh, you got to think that those juniors are, you know, that are going to be seniors next year should be in really good spots. The freshmen that played quite a bit, you know, with Tanner and, and Xavier, uh, they're going to have another year under their belt. And, uh, you got to think that Rochester is going to be really strong coming. Right, next you got year. two all two all RT, two all TRC guards coming back next year. When you talk about Paul Leisure and Tarek McLaughlin, sure. and you've got a kid who made honorable mention all TRC as a freshman, Tanner Reiner, so he'll be back. Uh, you know, Luke Hunting is a guy who's going to be back as well. I, mm -hmm. You know, Luke had a, I, I think Luke exceeded the expectations with his performance. So, uh, yeah, I mean, all five starters will be back from the team that you know started that sectional game against Lewis Cass last Tuesday so mm -hmm. um, it's just you know playing more together and and being able to handle the physicality of the high school game because they just got overwhelmed by teams that played physical yeah whether it was Lewis Cass or Peru or 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 North Judson yeah I mean uh, you know if you look at if you look at all the really good teams they played they were all more physical than Rochester was yeah well, and you got to look at too. If you, if you look at that sectional uh, that Rochester is in, obviously Lewis Cass has still got a lot of kids coming back. But you know, I I don't see why a, a improved Rochester team is is not right there competing for that sectional next year. Right, right, and um, yeah, I mean they'll they'll be in the mix. I mean, uh, you know, Rochester they've not stayed down for long under Coach Malco. I mean they mm -hmm. um, they're going to have to get have to get a defensive identity too. I mm -hmm. think that's we we've always talked about defensive identity is with Coach Malco. You know, again we always go back to the basically that whole run from two thousand six through two thousand ten, you know, when it was kind of a that half court trap was their defensive identity and then mm -hmm. that ability you know, to press and trap and to to create to create havoc. Um and then we think about the twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one teams that went back to back sessions, those were those teams played a really good zone defense. Right. Right. In fact, really, really since Coach Malco has come back for a second stint in 2017, it's really been mostly zoned for the last you know five years. Mm -hmm. You know, then they got they got going with the man. You know, they had that winning streak with the man. But uh, again, when you face more physical teams, that's when they ran into problems with the man. So then they had to go back to zone. And again, there was I'm not sure, but I'm not sure they were comfortable in that. So yeah. figuring some things out defensively, I think, will be big next year. Yeah, and they they kind of went uh, you know to that up up tempo style after that cast and loss, and you know that seemed to work for them as well. But I, I still think that's one of those things right. that you can't just flip a switch mm -hmm. and say you're going to be an up tempo team. You actually you know it takes some time and yeah. If they want to stick with that, I think the summer is going to really help them. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, the kids talked about boy, our, our practices were really tough, mm -hmm. especially after that cast and game. We you know our practices were just. They went to another level in terms of how hard we worked, and I think that so they developed that work ethic. But that's how you can kind of maybe try and play that up tempo style. Yeah, 
And I think that shows some mm-hmm. of the character of that team because that was a bad loss. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the, the season could have really went into the tank for them after that, and, and it didn't. They they were able to come back right. and, and, and get some big wins. And then they're down by 14 against Manchester in the fourth quarter, and they come back to win that game. Right. So that, 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 that was, yeah, I mean, the, you know, people will look at 9-13 and 13 and say, boy, that – uh, that's not what we what we're used to or what we expect or that's a that's a disappointment after winning two straight sectionals but I think that was you know to the season could have gone off the rails like you said mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and if and if you look at that last zero and five stretch to close out the season three of those five losses were to sectional champions mm-hmm. Triton Peru Southwood mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. And, and at the beginning of the season I think if you said okay this team's going to win nine games I think that you might have been happy with that. I mean, it was just a transition season for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, they've got a lot of positive things. Not only the the kids coming up, they had a really good JV team this year. Uh, You know, even their freshman team. I mean, you know, Coach McCarter and the the freshman uh, C team uh, had a really good year. I mean, they're just... And not a lot of schools the size of Rochester even have a C team. Right. And yet they not only had a C team, but they went undefeated. And that means that kids want to play basketball at Rochester, and that's a good sign. Right. So you start moving those kids up into the into the system and working them up towards the varsity, right. and they've got a really good eighth grade class that's going to be coming in next year. That uh, you know, so I think things are looking really positive. I think kids like Owen Prater and Dylan Hook got a few varsity sure. minutes toward the end of the year. Uh, Brady Bogger uh, had you know a nice year in the JV as well. Uh, the next Bowers, uh, mm-hmm. Drew Bowers. Drew. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he had a nice year in the JV as well. So yeah, and it's it's uh, they don't have they don't have I don't know if they have that they can play that same style that the twenty 2020 twenty and twenty one teams mm-hmm. did with Reinerts and Stasiak and Hughes, but it might be a different type of team. Yeah, yeah, but things mm-hmm. things look really good I think for them. Yeah. So, but uh, they, I mean there are a lot of good young players in the TRC. Yeah, yeah. I mean there are a lot of, there are a lot of good players with Bagna. I mean, uh, not a lot. Of, there are not, I mean, obviously Matt Ross at Peru. I think he was probably the best player in the TRC. He's graduating, but mm-hmm. a lot of good players in the TRC will be back. When you talk about, you know, Weiner from Southwood, Josiah Ball, the really impressed freshman from Maconaqua. Weiner's not graduated yet. He's only a junior. Uh, wow. He seems like he's been around forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, Retger from Peru had a really great game against Benton Central in their sectional final win. Yeah. He's only a sophomore. Right. Uh and then the younger Ross, the younger brother. Ross, he's only a what he's only a soft yeah, freshman, so. sophomore. sophomore. Yeah, I mean the nucleus of that Wabash team was sophomores. When you talk about Ford, Wright, and uh, uh, Daughtry, I mean that Benton from Manchester, he's only a freshman. Right. I mean yeah. their, their point nice. guard was only a freshman. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean there are a lot of good young players in this conference. Yeah, and you were talking about Valley as they move into the. I mean, they're. Braden Burns from North Miami made a first team all conference. He's only a junior. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Valley is another team that, that uh, you know, looks to have a good year coming up. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, Tate Kaiser uh, made first team all TRC. Nolan Cumberland made first team all TRC. They're both juniors. They'll be mm-hmm. back next year. You know, Braden Shepard was honorable mention all TRC. He graduates. Braden was playing the best basketball of his career at the end. He had a mm-hmm. huge game when they beat West Noble in the the Tuesday night of sectionals week when he scored 20. Mm-hmm. And he went 9 for 9 from the foul line in that game, in a game they won by 4. Yeah. I mean, Braden, I, mean I, I, I hate that for Braden because, you know, when when, you know, when Riley Shepard went down, Braden Shepard really had to pick up his scoring, and he did. Mm-hmm. And that's that, that was just solid because Braden just did a little bit of everything yeah. to help out that team. He'll be missed. And, yeah. They'll get Riley back, so mm-hmm. you know that was a big loss for them at the end of the year. But they were able to kind of overcome that. Yeah, yeah, and, and Riley's only going to get better too because he's again Riley's only a sophomore, mm-hmm. and I mean he's a guy who, I mean teams are going to run run out at the three point line on him, and he's only going to get better at putting the ball on the floor and driving by guys. And again, he's six four and he's so long, he only needs a couple steps to get to the basket. Yeah, yeah, and. It, you know, you got to look at a team like Caston. You know, we talked about the five senior starters. Um, Do not feel sorry for Carl Davis. Right. I mean, they've got a great JV program. They won twenty and two. Yeah. In the JV. Yeah, and then you got you know Shane Lobb that's going to be coming back next year as well. Um, You've got a point guard already in Colby Pugh, yeah, who was playing so big minutes toward the end of the year. You've you got a kid in Talon Zider who played great on the JV. He would have played varsity at a lot of places. 
it, it's hard to imagine a 1A school graduating five senior starters and you're saying they should be okay next year. Yeah. I mean, Caleb Stinson had a really good year in the JV. He's mm -hmm. probably a guy who would have seen some varsity minutes at a lot of places. Right. And he'll be – so, I mean – yeah, I mean, you know, Evan. I think they even had some CT games, didn't they? Uh, a few, maybe. Yeah. 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 So, but you know, Coach Woodhouse and Coach Chandler do a great job on Coach Davis's coaching staff with those guys. And again, we we always talk about that cultural player development that Coach Davis has built there, and that's that's really good. Evan Howard's a kid who I think could get some varsity minutes mm -hmm. uh, next year. So, yeah, again, that I mean, they I mean they were twenty and two, and they a lot of the twenty wins were not even close. I mean, those yeah. games were over at halftime. So. The culture has been said, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would not panic if I were a Caston fan. Yeah, and a name that you're familiar with, a Caston Rensselaer. There's another one of them coming up. Jackson Rensselaer, he's another, you know, he's, guy with good size and good yeah. athleticism. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think Caston's going to be in really good shape. You got to look at that sectional there, with uh, with North White graduating a big, big chunk of their team. Now North White struggled on the JV level. I mean, North yeah. White only goes six deep. Now the question is, we'll have sectional realignment. Are these teams going to be be in the same section, or might they move Caston down to the to that Northfield Southwood sectional? Mm -hmm. That's a possibility, right? So, but as it stands, you, if, if you look at this the sectional as mm -hmm. it stands, I mean, boy, that thing seems to be wide open. Yeah, if it's still the same next year, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the other team, uh, Argus, graduating four senior starters. Uh, you know, you got JJ Morris coming back. You got Sean Richards, Richard coming back. Um, other than that, boy, that's going to be uh, interesting to see. You know, how do you put those pieces together? Yeah. And another team that didn't have the greatest of uh, JVs, and I mean, you got a you got a younger Stoltz coming up with uh, Luke, Luke Stoltz, Elijah Osborne. Those are kind of the future names, but there's got to be some player development there mm -hmm. um, because you know, uh, Sean Richard, I think, is going to be a guy. It'll be interesting to see how his role kind of develops over time. Yeah. You're, you're losing a lot of size, obviously, with Dylan graduating. Right. I mean, Sean was one of those guys who, as a sophomore, was not afraid to bang around with a lot of other big men on other teams, and that was mm -hmm. great to have. But will his role have to evolve? Will he have, have to look to score a little bit more next year? Yeah, and who's going to handle the ball for him? Mm -hmm. That's going to be a that's going to be a big miss with Michael graduating. I mean, boy, that's something that's just been a luxury for Argus. It's really nothing they've had to worry about for the last five, six years when you talk about Nate Manikowski and, and Michael Richard. Sam. Yeah. Yeah. It's Sam Manica. Yeah. Nate's his younger brother. Yeah. Nate, yeah. Nate's the future. Sam's the old man. Yeah, maybe maybe but yeah. and then, you know, you talk about that, you know, point guard, you go back, you know, you know, to Vinny, to Jalen, yeah. Javen, uh yeah, Javen, you know, yeah. They they've been solid at point guard for a long time and, and that's gonna be one big question mark for him next year. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they'll they'll be uh you know, and Culver's gonna be another one of those teams that uh, you know, They've got some pieces coming back, but how do you fill in those gaps on those uh, seniors that are graduating? I mean, you got some some size graduating, obviously, with uh, Zayner and yeah, Austin Zayner was one of those guys who just always was made the right decisions with the ball in his hands, mm -hmm. became a better outside shooter as his pro career progressed. He graduates, um, but you've you've got Ethan Keller, who's just kind of the Energizer Bunny out there. I mean, he plays 32 minutes a game mm -hmm. and never seems to get tired, and you know. He, his main role is, I think, to bother people defensively. Will he maybe look to score a little bit more next year? Yeah. And then Mason Herbert, um, he's a guy who's his, – his offensive game is only going to grow because he's had some injury problems. If he can have an injury-free summer just to work on his game, that's really going to improve. Because you saw Culver trying to post Mason up. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a legit 6'4". Right, right. He needs to get inside a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought Shane Schumann late in the year kind of came on for them as well, and he'll be yeah, back. Yeah, I mean, and Shane is not afraid of physical play. Right, we know that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And then you, you talk about the sectional at, um, you know, 52. 50, you got to think, you know, Triton's graduating uh, five senior starters as well. So, you know, that thing might be, if it's the same constitution, yeah, might be they, wide they open. Might be, that, that, that's a team that might be in a quote-unquote quote transition year when right. you talk about, you know, uh, graduating five seniors. I mean, Graham, uh, I think, will be back. But, I mean, who will, be, who will play guard for them? Mm -hmm. And who will, because, you know, they were kind of a guard-oriented team, mm -hmm. you know, these past two years. Now, how, how will their style of play change? Yeah. Ortiz at Culver, I can't remember. Is he a senior? He's a junior. Junior, so, so he'll, he'll be, be back. back. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe uh, you know that. Obviously, you know we talked about it. defense with Culver is not an issue. Yeah, can they can they get the ball in the basket more mm -hmm. uh, often than they have? 
Right, right. So, and then, you know, you look at a team like Pioneer, you know, they've got a, they got five seniors, they're graduating, that have, you know, a lot of playing time, so there's going to be a, a bit of a transition there as well. I don't, yeah. I don't know a ton about their JV. I don't think they've had the strongest season, so it's it's hard. I mean, obviously you got Drew McCaig coming back, you so just, you got to feel good about that yeah, as, a, as a starting you, block. You, 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 you would love for some of these kids to have one more year, give mm -hmm. Oscar Solano another year, right. especially with the confidence that he had built up. Mm -hmm. Give Jacob Ziegler another year with the confidence that he had built up. You'd love to get the, see those guys, but I think there's a pretty good nucleus when you start with McKeg and Sweet. Right. And I, I know, um, I, I don't Ball know. Ball handling is going to be something that... Yeah, and I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. basketball-wise, I know they've got a really good uh, eighth-grade class that's really strong in football. Mm -hmm. I don't know how well they are in basketball, but, uh, yeah, that's going to be kind of one of those. And, you know, Pioneer's one of those schools that's obviously football first mm -hmm. and second and third. It, it, but it was another year where their basketball team was definitely playing pretty well by the end of the season. I right. mean, it, it took a little while, but, right. I mean, they, they figured a lot of, figured out how they wanted to play and, yeah, they were playing pretty well by the end of the year. Yeah, but again, it's the mid, the Hoosier North Conference is a tough conference. Yeah, yeah, it's going to continue to be tough. And as you talk conference wise, as far as Hoosier North, you know, you got North Judson, who's had a strong season this mm -hmm. year. Uh, they're graduating a lot of kids as well. So I mean, the conference is going to be interesting next year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because Caston went seven and zero, and North Judson went six and one. Both teams, you know, North Judson wound up winning their two way sectional, but both teams suffered a lot of graduation losses. Yeah, as well as. Triton. Yeah, casting the top three teams. And who was coming on at the end of the year that nobody was talking about? Knox. Yeah. Knox started 0 and 3, finished 4 and 3. Knox won at Triton. Mm hmm. Um, won at Winnemac. I mean, they, they had some nice wins toward the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, won at LaVille, beat LaVille at LaVille by 15. Yeah. I mean, that, that was a Knox team. Kudos to Coach Kruger over there. He, he really got, they were playing pretty well by the end of the year. Yeah. And, and you got to think, you know, LaVille. How, you know they're not going to be down for long uh, with uh, Coach Edison. I right, think. with Zarnecki and Plummer coming yeah. back, and Owen Smith. He he was a kid who kind of became their third scorer at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean we talked about how young their football team was, only one senior and they won sectional. Mm -hmm. Their basketball team was really young too. Yeah, yep. it's kind of not a lot, not a whole lot of seniors at Laville among Laville boys who are playing a lot, making a big contribution either football or basketball. Right. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Obviously, you know, every year is a new year, and, and we'll see, you know, who comes in and, and who does what. And it's, mm -hmm. a, it's always fun to kind of do early, early speculation on, on, you know, what's going to happen. But sure, a lot of a lot of time between now and the start of uh, boys basketball season next fall. Yeah, but definitely a lot of good players in the area coming back. Yeah, should be should be a fun season. So. We're going to take a quick break here as we uh, move into, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we got coming up in the spring seasons. So we'll be back here in just a moment on Talking Sports with Val. Hey, welcome back here. We're Talking Sports with Val on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it's going to be a, a quiet weekend for us with uh, no basketball going on. All of our teams are done. And uh, we're starting to think spring as there's snow on the ground outside but uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, our baseball, softball, track, and golf, and tennis, and all that stuff getting going here uh, shortly as we move into the spring seasons. And as we said, Val's going to be off next week, so uh, no show next week. I'm going to be off the following week for spring break, so no show that week. So our next uh, show will be on April 1st, and we're going to reveal our all RTC teams for the winter for boys and girls basketball, for swimming, and for uh, wrestling. So we will. Uh, so cancel all your spring break plans immediately. Yeah, if you're if you're planning on being gone on April first, make sure you're <laughs> at least somewhere where you can get to the internet. Yeah, yeah. you can still go. I'm not going to be like Val. I, I'll let you go on vacation. You just make sure you're close to your uh, computer at 2 p.m. on Friday. April I won't. 1st. I want all plane tickets canceled. <laughs> So, uh, you know, as we look into uh, spring sports, um, you know, obviously Rochester baseball comes to mind first and foremost with uh, what they did last year winning the sectional. Uh, they've got so many kids coming back. I mean, obviously they graduated, you know, quite, a, uh, you know, some good players with uh, with Beeler and McCarter and, and Stasiak. But Kane, they, Lute, Kane Lutz was a key part of that team as sure. the season progressed. Kyle uh, Reinerts was, you know, had a great year. Right, right. Uh, you know, so they, they've got some pieces to fill in the gaps, but they've got, you know, this junior class, I mean, as good as they were on the basketball floor, uh, most of them are probably baseball players first. Mm -hmm. 
and they look to have a really good year. And I, I expect uh, you might see something out of uh, a couple freshmen as well who uh, had uh, really good careers up to this point in baseball. Well, yeah, I've talked to some of the freshmen. They're they're pretty avid baseball players. Yeah, yeah I mean they, they could they could step in and make an immediate impact on the varsity field right away. But for the Zebras, the, I think it comes down to one word, pitching. Right. I mean, who is, if you graduate Brock Beeler and Kyle Reinerts, they, they were Rochester's two best pitchers, and they ate up just about every inning in conference play and postseason play. So mm-hmm. who's going to step in and, and, and fill those shoes on the mound? Right. You know, Brock was such a uh, constant force as far as pitching goes. He was kind of reminds me of, a, of Greg Maddox, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he wasn't the hardest-throwing pitcher in the world, but... He just seemed to be able to outthink the other, uh, the batter, a lot of times, and placement was always key for him. And and then you would go, you know, right. There was a lot of soft contact, a lot of, you know, routine ground balls and pop ups. Mm-hmm. And, and Kyle was so good, obviously coming in from the left side. You, you if you're a, a solid left hand pitcher, uh, you know, you can you can do a lot of things that, you know, people just aren't used to seeing in high school. So. Mm-hmm. They they do have uh, they do have some question marks on the mound. Right, Tarek McLaughlin is probably their most experienced pitcher. We saw him as more of kind of a, like a closer last year, mm-hmm. who would come in in that seventh inning and, and just kind of come in with a lot of heat. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if uh, Tarek's going to be can you know I don't think they ever really asked him to give him five six seven innings at a time. So we'll see if Tarek evolves as that. And of course, when you put Tarek on the mound, you take away from defensively from your team at shortstop because sure. Tarek's a really good defensive shortstop as well. Yeah, he's just a good shortstop. Period. And offensively, the, defensively, everything. Yeah, and that was the nice thing that you could uh, you could do obviously with with Brock or with Kyle on the mound. You mm-hmm. you, you had him in his natural position, which mm-hmm. is short. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, and that's going to be uh, you know, and then Brock would uh, play a pretty good third base. So mm-hmm. you know, who's going to fill in that spot as well? Right, Evan Elliott's played some third base in the past. He's played mostly outfield, but. That would be my first guess mm-hmm. if I had to wonder, but a good practice doesn't even start until Monday. Right. So we're just speculating. Right. And, you know, they should be pretty solid behind the plate. Right. With Jake Cipher, I mean, he's only a sophomore, but he played basically every inning of every game last year at catcher. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. he caught every every pitch, didn't he? I, I don't remember anybody else catching. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, we did, we did a good chunk of the games. I, I never saw anyone yeah. else behind the plate. Right. I, I think you're right. I, yeah. So... Uh, yeah, you know that's going to be interesting for uh, you know see how the uh, the pitching evolves for them and um, I'm trying to think was it Huffman came in and right well Aaron yeah I was going to say Aaron's probably he he might be the most experienced varsity pitcher he, along with McLaughlin yeah I mean towards the end of the year there he came in and pitched a couple of uh, pretty pretty big games for them right yeah. I I'll, I'll think of what the job Aaron did in relief of Reinhardt's in that game against Wabash in the sectional semifinals mm-hmm. when he pitched very very well and got some big outs in that game yeah so uh, you know they may look to him uh, you know on the mound a little bit more this year and. Uh, Right. You know, there's there's just such a uh, a, a wider range of, uh, you know, they had a really good JV team last year. Mm-hmm. So who's going to step up off of that and, you know, get some uh, some varsity innings? There was a lot. I mean, it's a lot of long hard work went into building this program. Mm-hmm. I mean, from and and to see where it is now, this is going to be the kind of the interesting test to see, okay, how much of that player development that you worked on over the years, how much it was going to pay off because of all the kids you lost to graduation last year. Yeah, Coach Good. Uh, had not won a sectional game going into the year last mm-hmm. year. He wins a sectional game and then ends up winning a sectional. Mm-hmm. So you know you got to feel like uh, you know now right. now unfortunately the pressure is probably going to be on a little bit, right? Because mm-hmm. you're you're not the underdog. Yeah. You know now you're the sectional champ and you're coming back and trying to repeat. So mm-hmm. TRC wise, you've got Southwood who went nine and zero last year, mm-hmm. and sectional wise, I'm really looking at that Carroll Cougar ball club. Mm-hmm. I mean, they bring back a lot of kids from last year and the, some dynamite pitching, and they, they don't have the pitching questions that Rochester might have. Right. And another team in the TRC that we cover that uh, should be pretty solid on the mound would be the Valley Vikings. Oh, yeah. Owen Kirkenstein, if if he's not the best pitcher in the TRC, he's certainly in the conversation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've got some, you know, some more experienced kids there. I mean, uh, when you talk about Anakin... Um, had it, I mean, that catcher, I mean, he's another veteran catcher, and Atkins only a junior. And then, uh, you know, a kid like Damian Kohler, I mean, he's, you know, you've got some experienced kids on the, out on the field as well. I think, I think they'll be, I think Coach 
uh, you know, uh, Little John will have you know a pretty good defensive ball club there. I think the question is, will they hit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that was I, the question I, I, last I think, year. I think that was kind of. Mm-hmm. I mean, that they were, in, they, and again, this is a program that's, you know, just like the boys' basketball program, they're dealing with a horrific tragedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, how will they bounce back? I mean, they they, they showed some great courage because it happened in the middle of their season last right, year, right. and they beat Southwood, who was ranked number one in one A at the time. Yeah, coming off of that. Coming off that. Mm-hmm. I mean, so. Um, sectionals at Jimtown this year. Uh, I, I think it's a winnable sectional. You know, Northwood, they're always solid in baseball as well. Uh, but, you know, it's going to come down to who's hot that week, that last week in May. Yeah. Another area team that uh, should be doing pretty well, and we talked about, obviously, with with their success on the basketball floor with those seniors is the Caston Comets. Well, the RTC Baseball Player of the Year last year was Joey Spin. Mm-hmm. I mean, Joey is, there's nothing really in a baseball field that Joey can't do. Mm-hmm. I mean, he can hit. He's a great base dealer. He's got great speed, and he's a really, really good pitcher as well. I mean, he's you know he's a guy you can, he's one of those guys where if he's on his game, you might, you know, you're walking back to the dugout a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. he's he can he's a guy who can strike out 12, 14, 15 guys in a game. Mm-hmm. He's that good. And then the number two pitcher is Cade Zider, and Cade is a guy who's pitched his whole life as well. Mm-hmm. So there will be you know Coach Mollenkopf will have very few question marks, pitching wise. I mean, they were just a team that. They just kind of weren't at that level that Southwood was at last year. Can they get to that level? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Southwood, you know, Mo Lloyd at catcher, you know, probably the best player in the TRC, one of the better players in the northern half of the state. Mo is a stud at catcher. He's a, I think he's hit like 600 last year. I mean, he is a crazy good hitter. Right. And he's only a junior. Right. We saw him on the football field. He's, oh, been, yeah. he's been probably in, in the batting cage all winter, and he'll be, yeah, he's tough. Yeah. Uh, another team that uh, was kind of up and coming last year that has some really good young pitching is the Pioneer Panthers. Yeah, when you talk about Braden Erickson, we saw him a little bit on the basketball court, but mm-hmm. you know, uh, Bubby's best sport is baseball, and he is he he. I mean, he he did not look like a freshman out there on the mound. He he's passionate about the game. And he had an ex- he had really an idea of what he wanted to do out there, and you just don't see kids like that pitch very often. Yeah, and he he's another guy who can just shut you down. Yeah. But really, I mean, he really, he's really polished for a sophomore. Right. I mean, much, much, much more than any, most, much more than most seniors, really. Yeah. Well, and you watch him on the mound, and mm-hmm. he's just so calm. Yeah. I mean, there's just a calmness to him. Mm-hmm. He doesn't feel rushed. And you, you talk about in, in basketball, you talk about in football, the game slows down mm-hmm. as you get experience and you, you get, uh, you know, more comfortable. And I think the game is really slow for him. Yeah. I think he uh, he sees the game um Thinks the game uh, better than a lot. Right. I think catcher will be an issue for them. Right. And but um, I, you know, again, their ballpark lends itself to hitting. Mm-hmm. But it's can you can you hit against the really good pitchers on your schedule, mm-hmm. especially when you're not playing at home. Right. Uh, I think Oscar Solano will probably play a big role in this team. Caleb Sweet will play a big role in this team. Yeah. Yeah. It should be it should be interesting, and uh, you know, their their sectional, uh, you know, it's pretty open as well. Right, I think you'd have to say Southwood would be the favorite right off the bat, but again, that, that sectional's kind of always been wide open. But mm-hmm. again, Southwood, Ka- you know, Caston will be good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but again, the, the Hoosier North was so. I think we, we had a four-way tie last year. It was a Pioneer, Winnemac, North Judson, and Knox. Okay. And then Caston was fifth place, just one game behind those four. Yeah. So the Hoosier North will be a dogfight all year. Right. And you, ha- you, especially because they play the double round robin. Right. So you see, everybody's. Number one pitcher and their number two pitcher. Right. Really, really tests your depth. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it should be interesting. And of course, you know, as you as you look at softball, uh, obviously things start at uh, Royal Center for uh, for our area with the uh, defending two A state champions, and you know, it all starts with uh, Haley Kripe, Obviously, you know the the Kansas Jayhawk commit. Mm-hmm. I mean. Uh, you know, she's just uh, she's led the the state in, in home runs both of the seasons that she's played. Mm-hmm. Obviously, missed her entire sophomore year with the COVID uh, pandemic. With nobody played that year, yeah. but uh, you know, seeing Pioneer softball play in person for a, you were obviously maybe more familiar with it than I was, but seeing them just play in kind of a fairly regular basis is just kind of like how they're not, they're not as good of a slugging team as they are. They just aren't just sluggers, right? And that was just what was so impressive. They could score runs in a variety of different ways. Mm-hmm. 
and you had just so much to worry about. They just put so much pressure on you, and that was so impressive with their offense. And then, you know, pitching wise, I mean, it was just, you know, I mean, I don't know how you replace a Haley Gottschall, but this is a pioneer program that's had a long history of success. Yeah, it's going to be tough. Obviously, you know, Haley Kripe can can obviously pitch, but if you put her on the mound or in the circle, mm-hmm. then you're taking her out of her uh, her comfort zone, which mm-hmm. is shortstop mm-hmm. and. Uh, you can't pitch her every inning of every game. So who's going to be that pitcher that steps up and takes some innings from her? Mm -hmm. That's going to be the big thing, right? Right. Uh, Hopefully Bob Blickenstaff will be back from the injury woes that really uh, derailed her volleyball season, kept her out of basketball entirely. Mm -hmm. That'll be great. I think Mackenzie Robinson will be more than fine as a catcher. Yeah. And then, you you know, you got obviously like Kylie Ferris. You know, she's just huge leading Mm -hmm. off for them. Uh, you got the the young guns uh, coming in with uh, with Adinger and uh, Borges. I mean, mm-hmm. you know how good were they at the end of the season last year? They were really big for them, and yeah, you know Kylie Kylie mm-hmm. at the uh, the regional game. I mean, just you know some of the stuff that she did against Wheeler was just huge. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So you know they're it, it's hard to imagine. Like like you said, you, you lose uh, you know Blickenstaff. You lose uh, Walker, mm-hmm. you know the the most reliable catcher that you could ever mm-hmm. have, and then you lose Tino, the you know Haley Gotchall. Mm-hmm. But coming back, I mean, they're obviously going to have to fill in those gaps, but they're not going to be hurting. Pioneer has been really great in softball for decades. Yeah, yeah. I mean they they're able to they they continue. It's kind of like their football team, right? Yeah. They just keep uh, keep reworking. You thought when they lost Jack Kaiser that things would you know fall off for them, and it you know it hasn't. Right, right. So. I mean, the, this is a team that they're they're just very conscientious of the details of the game, mm-hmm. and I, and I think that that always serves them well. They they look at they see the small picture and the big picture really well. Pioneer softball kind of reminds me of Argus soccer. Mm-hmm. They just start at such a young age, and it's just kind of ingrained. And it's kind of what they do. Right. They just do softball. Mm-hmm. Kind of like Argus just does soccer. Right. And you get players who get experience to the point of, you know, Haley Gottschall just kind of, you know, she could be, I, I just, again, I've never been so admiring of a almost any athlete in terms of, you know, when the heat was on, the, the pitches that she was able to execute. <laughs> And she knew exactly what to do, and she she knew how to read the batters. And okay, I know I can throw this pitch here. Mm-hmm. And I mean that takes, I mean that takes so much uh, guts and intelligence and 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 you know moxie and mm-hmm. all those words. But she just you know she just was in the moment all the time. Yeah. And thinking of how, you know, and how she processed that against Sullivan. When she didn't have her best stuff that day, right? Well, and it's just proving, you mm-hmm. know, how good she is. If you if you've watched anything that she's done this year, down at uh, Southern Indiana, I mean, she's just been tremendous for him already, and mm-hmm. so that just proves to you how good she was. Um, talking about the Rochester Zebras, Coach Lee in her second season now, uh, she's got some question marks in the rubber on the rubber mm-hmm. in the circle. Right, Maya um, Musselman graduates, and that's you know they'll miss Maya. Yeah. So pitching is going to be a big question. I know last year depth was a big issue for them. They're going to, uh, you know, hopefully have some more uh, players coming out this year. But uh, right, and you who, know, who's healthy? Maddie Heinzman and Emma Hodeshell suffered those knee injuries during basketball season. Right, and that's the left side of your infield, basically. Right. Um, uh, probably not going to be back yet. I would think. I don't know. Right. One one thing I just remember talking with just some kids, and that it's the the field, the defense part, I think, will be okay. It's the it's the hitting part because mm-hmm. you put a lot of torque on that knee mm-hmm. when you hit. When you're in the box, you're twisting your knee or and kind of trying to get your legs in your swing. Uh, how will they handle that? Mm-hmm. You know, catcher. Well, again, catcher. I, I'm, that's kind of one of the first things I I've learned to look at. Who's your catcher? Callie Watson, I think, will be more than fine at that position. Right. Right. Yeah. She she kind of took over. Um, was more towards the end of the year, right? That she kind of got back there for Emma right, and moved it. Emma over to short. Right, you know? right. So yeah, I mean it's it's going to be uh, interesting and uh, right. And again, Kylie Coleman. I know she played a lot of outfield toward the end of last year, but Kylie can play shortstop if you need her to. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, it's it's going to be tough right out of the gate. I was looking at some of the spring schedules. They've got a round robin coming up in uh, early April with uh, Carol and Pioneer coming to town. Mm-hmm. So they're going to have a couple of uh, really tough games early in the year over at Chancellor. So, yeah. um, you know, they're going to be tested early and often. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, TRC-wise, uh, you, you know, you, you got to look at uh, Valley and, and, you know, their improvements. they they got to be, uh, you know, thought about, you know, in the mix for the – conference as well i mean they were yeah i mean they you know they they got it they got a taste last year mm-hmm. i mean you, you get to the sectional final and you know you take on a whitco team that you were competitive with and i mean you know coach matthias she she was just shopping at the bit for practice to get started and now she's got a week under her belt and you talk about Braden baney i mean she's one of the best shortstops in the area you know corinna styles is you know, probably their ace, but she's not their only pitcher. I mean, Macy Kirkenstein can help out in the circle as well. Uh, you know, Brittany Ben is back. I mean, mm-hmm. she gives them another solid bat in that lineup. Uh, this is, you know, Molly Moriarty gives them a lot of speed. Mm-hmm. You know, can gives them some defensive versatility. Uh, yeah, I mean, Mercedes Snap will be back. I mean, uh, hopefully Mercedes is over whatever injury that bothered her at the end of basketball season. Put her at first base. I mean, she's pretty solid there. And, of course, Maddie Smith behind the plate. I mean, a, a veteran veteran backstop. I mean, this is this is a team that's not as many question marks now as we had a year ago at this time about right. the team, especially coming off the, the COVID year. And, okay, right. who, who do they have? Right. Now a we lot know, of, now a lot know of young they, players last year that have had uh, a year under their belt. Right. Now we know who they have. And, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, the, you know, this team is, uh, this team's got big plans. Yeah. Should be exciting. And you talk about Whitco, obviously they've been strong, but uh, the the older Gar sister, right, graduate. Right. So, uh, you know, they're going to be uh, down to one Gar. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think she was the pitcher, right? The catcher is still there. Right. So, you know, uh, that was kind of the dominant force for the Whitco Wildcats last year. Right. G- I think Gwynny graduated and Gus is back. Sounds right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. again, I mean, the, you know, Coach Gar, I mean, she's, you know, she's built a, a very solid program at Whitco, and I would imagine the they will not. You will not be able to overlook them easily, mm-hmm. and it's you know it's a pretty solid lineup they have year in and year out. They they always seem to hit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it'd be interesting. Uh, you know, trying to think. You know, TRC wise. You know, what, what's your again? Nor- again, obviously Northfield coming off the state championship, but I mean, uh, pitching wise is going to be the big question. And sure. you, you lose an Addie Baker to graduation. That's a that's a once a decade type of player. Right. Once every. T- Two decades type of player, yeah, a I mean, generational type of player. I mean, I mean, they, and they were so good defensively, and of course that sectional is just brutally tough. I mean, that mm-hmm. that's one of the one A sectional at softball sectional North Miami is going to be one of the best so, softball sectionals in the state at one A. Mm-hmm. When you talk about Caston and North Miami and Northfield, yeah, I mean that's, uh, and, and oh yeah, West Central. Yeah, I mean yeah, that West Central team was about as young as Caston last year, and they've got they've got a terrific player in Annika Smith. Mm-hmm. I mean, she is she is really tough. Well, you you mentioned the other team that I was going to talk about, uh, you know, softball wise, the cast and comments. Obviously, you know, with Zippelman, uh, you know, mm-hmm. she's just, you know, as good as she is on the basketball floor, she is a hundred percent in on softball and you know, Bell Scales. I mean, she's you know big time, and, and you yeah. got to think about Mollenkopf and you know how how young you know this team is and, oh, yeah. and how good they are. I mean, their lineup is just a nightmare. One, one, about one through five. I mean, you got Maddie Smith, who's the other Maddie Smith. Valley's got Maddie with one D, and Caston's got Maddie with two Ds. Maddie Smith from Caston is just, I mean, sh- you know, she's as a slap hitter and as a leadoff hitter, it just seems it seems like it takes her about three steps to get to first base mm-hmm. when she just puts the ball in the ground. And she just, and she kind of came late to slapping, and she really just got the hang of it more and more as the season went on. But she's also can step, I mean, she's can step to the right side of the plate and hit and hit hit away. If they need her to do that, mm-hmm. and boy, I mean, their lineup is just a nightmare, though. Mollenkopf, Zimpleman, Isabel Scales. I mean, they. I wouldn't be surprised if Bell led the state in RBIs. I mean, she's just. I mean, she's that good, <laughs> and there's going to be there's going to be people on base in front of her all all year long. Mm-hmm. You talk about who's your North Conference in baseball. I mean, it is a brutal conference, obviously in softball. You know, you got. The defending two A state champion, you've got uh, you know Winnemac should be back and solid next year, mm-hmm. this year as well, and then Caston and I mean you know those three on top of that conference. I mean it's it's a 
It's going to be a dog fight. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And you know Kasten is going to be, uh, you know, wanting to get back. You know, they've they've been that kind of little little sister, right, mm-hmm. the pioneer for so long and trying to get that win against the Panthers and haven't been able to do it yet. I think with, for Kasten, defense will be big. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I really, I mean, I even like some of the younger freshmen who maybe weren't the maybe the the marquee players, but kids like Macy Hinderleiter and Alexa mm-hmm. Finke. I mm-hmm. think they're going to step into bigger roles this year, and they can play too. Yeah, and like Macy Hinderleiter, I mean, you can put her um, at several different positions defensively, second base, third base, just about anywhere in the outfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah and she's a solid hitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just a kind of a smaller girl, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, just a solid softball player. Yeah, so. And Mollenkoff and Zimbelman have been, just been pitching their whole lives. I mean, they. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I just, I remember the the Logan Sport game. You know, watching uh, Zimbelman warm up and listening to her dad. You know, he was just rattling off pitches. You know, throw this, throw this, throw this, throw this. Mm-hmm. You know, inside, outside, upside. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, and she was doing it. And, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's amazing to uh, to have a, a girl with with that many pitches and you know just a sophomore. Yeah. So. It's going to be a fun season, softball wise, uh, baseball wise. I right. think. Uh, I, think I think Culver's got a lot back. I think they'll. I know. I don't know if they'll be in that top echelon of teams, but I think they'll be better. Mm-hmm. And they're a team that I think will be able to hit a mm-hmm. little bit. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it should be interesting. You know, as you, as you look, uh, you know, mm-hmm. into the other sports that we maybe don't uh, do live events for. You know, like track and field and. Golf and, and tennis. That's uh, where I come in. <laughs> yeah, there's there's still a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff coming up there as well. Rochester's the reigning TRC champ in both girls and boys track, and I think they'll be they'll be in the mix at the sectional in both. Obviously, you know Culver Academy, but they're girls and boys. I mean they mm-hmm. they'll be they'll be formidable. I mean uh, Culver Academy had a great winner. They won sectionals in girls swimming, boys swimming, girls basketball, and boys basketball. But so you know they've got they've got a good stable full of athletes. But I think Rochester will be wanting to compete with them. Sure. And uh, tennis-wise, um, we just have the two, right? Valley and, and Rochester that do tennis in the spring? Right. So uh, I don't know a whole lot about uh, the tennis, so what, what's your thoughts on, on tennis? Um, I, I think uh, I think Valley's maybe a little bit more. They've got a little bit more experience on their team. I think with Rochester, they've got to kind of figure out their lineup a little bit. Um, you know, we saw, you know... Uh, a kid like Lilith Eaton come along last year and played doubles. Might she move to singles this year? Might you know she play a double? So, I think Coach Atkinson's got to figure out who fits in what spots. Mm-hmm. But again, practice doesn't even start until Monday. So right. And then just a quick here, uh, boys golf. Uh, any uh, any exciting golfers that we should be oh, paying attention to? You know, Rochester was hit hard by graduation because you graduate a kid like Reese Reaney and a kid like Wade Schaefer. I mean that um, that will affect uh, them. I I think. Uh, you know, it's kind of that. Th- can the three, four, five guys kind of move up? Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be. You know, I think they think they had pretty good numbers last year. I mean, Coach Bailey just spends a lot of time with those kids. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Obviously, Peru graduating. You know, Cash Beller, who was mm-hmm. state yeah. state champion and playing really well at the college level. I think at Ball State. Ball State, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean that. You know. That'll help him. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah, it opens the conference up a little bit. And, yeah. You know, his performance at state was just unbelievable. Uh, oh my you know, gosh, he shot thing, six, sixty-four. Yeah, I mean, when he went by eight strokes. Yeah, I mean, he just blew away in the competition. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I know a lot of the Rochester kids were friendly with him, and then, you know, uh, Valley with Adam Miller. I mean, he's a great player, and we'll see a new coach, Ben Shriver, okay. taking over at Valley. I mean, Ben's. A, there was a joke that you know, when he teach them how to throw the ball or like. <laughs> and of course, Ben's the all-time great quarterback in Valley. But Ben's, mm-hmm. I know Ben's a pretty avid golfer in his own right, and we'll see how he does in yeah. his first year as a golf coach. Well, we're looking forward to uh, to spring, not only for the sports, but for the the warmth, hopefully. And as it's snowing outside today, it's you know, as they say in Indiana, right? You know, if you don't like the weather, just wait a half an hour, and it'll probably change. Uh, I think we went through all four seasons last week. Yeah. Uh, last weekend, I mean, it was beautiful, 70 degrees, and then it got colder, so we went back to fall, and and then uh, we're back to winter, and it just uh, just one of those things. I mean, you grew up this in the region. I mean, yeah. you know as well as anybody does, right, what what the spring can be like. This is where indoor press boxes come, in, come into play in my life. Yeah. 
Well, that's the nice thing, too, is that, uh, you know, my daughter's running track this year, and we've had two track meets, but fortunately they've both been at Lambert at Purdue, mm -hmm. so they've been indoor, and that was kind of nice. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, obviously you get outside for the, the track meets yeah. and the softball and the baseball, mm -hmm. and who knows yeah. what the weather's going to be. Too much IHSA came out with sectional sites, the uh, girls' track sectional that Pioneer goes to, that'll be at Northwestern this year. It was at Western last year. And they flip flop the uh, girls and boys regional, which is that's always the week before Memorial Day. The, this year, the girls regional will be at Kokomo, and the boys on that, on that Tuesday night, and the boys regional will be at Goshen. Mm -hmm. It was the opposite last year. The girls regional was at Goshen and the boy, but this year the girls regional is at Kokomo, and the boys regional is at Goshen. Okay, and some of the um, softball and, and baseball um, sectional sites and and, and beyond. Uh, apparently they got, uh, we thought that the softball semi-state was going to be at Warsaw, but it's actually still going to be at Frontier. Still going to be at Frontier again next year, yeah. And then uh, uh, Wabash hosting baseball and softball sectionals for, right. you know, where Rochester uh, boys and girls will be playing, and then and the, 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 the Valley the softball. softball. Yeah, and the baseball, if whoever wins that Wabash baseball sectional will travel to Carroll, not not LCC. Not LCC. Yeah. LCC is hosting a 1A regional, mm -hmm. but not the 1A regional that we're concerned with. We're concerned with the 1A regional up in South Bend, up right. at Four Winds Field. Four Winds Field would be where Caston or Pioneer would end up, mm -hmm. or uh, or Argus or Culver. Or Argus or Culver, if they would happen to mm -hmm. uh, win their sectionals. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that sounds good. You got anything else you want to add? Getting ready to go on vacation. You got any big plans? Is watching NCAA tournament games at home kind of big plans? I kind of I, I say as long as you're not sending me stories, I, I will refuse <laughs> okay. to uh, post any stories okay. you send me next okay. week. So yeah. don't send me any. So you won't see any writings coming from Val for well, actually for a couple weeks if I'm off. I, I could probably post them when I'm off. Mm -hmm. I guess. But um, yeah, well, enjoy it. Uh, like okay. I said, Val will be off next week. I'll be off the following week. So we're going to be back on April first with our next show, Talking Sports with Val. And we've got some stuff coming up. I, I haven't really finalized our spring sports. Obviously, Valley with uh, softball, they, they seem to kick off uh, really early. Uh, right, because Val Valley has a later spring break than most of our other Yeah, so they actually schools. play several games before they go to spring break. We'll get some plans finalized here. I, I know uh, the one that I was definitely looking at softball-wise was that a round robin at Fansler with Rochester and Carroll and Pioneer playing. Mm -hmm. So definitely we're going to try and get that. The only issue is the the boys play a, a doubleheader against John Glenn that day as well. That's their home opener for uh, baseball as well. So mm -hmm. going to have to kind of decide on that. And we'll uh, we'll get more on that when, yeah. when we get closer. Yeah. So. yeah, I'm really looking forward to that baseball doubleheader. John Glenn has Bryson Hanna, who's one of the best uh, prospects in our area. Yeah. Great basketball player, too. Great basketball yeah. player and maybe even an even better baseball player. Is he really? Yeah. Okay. Well, that'll be, uh, that'll be coming up here as we uh, move back. We'll be back with more Talking Sports on April 1st. So uh, we'll, we'll do our all RTC teams. We'll reveal the, uh, the yeah. winner teams then. I wanted to give a shout-out to um, Garrett Weininger and his boys basketball team at Fishers. They had a great year. Fortunately, lost to just a Westfield team that got red, red hot. Mm -hmm. Westfield wound up winning the first sectional title in school history. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. That's mm -hmm. uh, I mean, beat Carmel on Saturday night, and and at Carmel's run of seven consecutive sectional titles. Yeah, of course, Carmel won state last year. Right. So yeah. Yeah, that's huge. Who do they play for uh, regional? Oh, you got me. Oh, Westfield plays. I think Homestead. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be a good one. That'll be a really good one. Well, speaking of Homestead. Uh, I, Iana, Iana Patterson, Patterson of, well, just won Miss Basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah the uh, 6'2 senior who's mm -hmm. unfortunately going to UConn. Mm -hmm. Would have liked to have kept her in state, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, congratulations to her for uh, winning the uh, Miss Basketball. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Is that it? I think that's it, yeah. All right, we're going to wrap it up. We'll see you all in April. Yeah.